Thank you very much, Natalie. And I also would like to welcome all the participants to this session. My name is Mirila Shuterici. I am the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Council of Voluntary Agencies, IGVA. IGVA is a network, global network of over 160 NGO members working together together for more principled and efficient humanitarian action. I will moderate this session, and I think this session is very important uh, because of, uh, of a subject that it's at its core. As we know, there is an increased recognition within the humanitarian sector that we need to reform the sector and the way we work by being more bottom up by building our intervention together with people affected by crisis and ensuring that they are engaged and have a say throughout the, the implementation. The people-centered approach also means that uh, humanitarian organizations are not only accountable to their donors and government, but first and foremost to the people affected by crisis. So these are some of the questions that we'll discuss today, looking in specific on uh, protection. And of course, very important because when we discuss with people affected by crisis and ask them to rate their priorities, protection will very often come on the top of a list. But ensuring a people-centered approach in protection work is not unless easy. And we see nowadays when international humanitarian law is not respected and is violated by the parties to the conflict, it's very difficult and very challenging to guarantee a people-centered approach in protection work. We see as humanitarian actors how difficult it is even to access to the people needing protection. Um, so this is, of course, a so call from myself and I guess from many of you to all the, the states to ensure a better respect for humanitarian, uh, international humanitarian law. Of course, another risk in ensuring a people-centered approach in protection work is then when we speak about people affected by crisis, we speak about a large group of diverse individuals who might have uh, diverse needs and face different kinds of vulnerabilities because of an individual situation and characteristics like gender, for example, age, uh, or because of a social belonging and social status, for example, members of religious or ethnic minorities. And unfortunately, in protection work, we are not only inclusive. The risk is that the most vulnerable individuals face a higher risk of not getting the right protection support. When we try to be inclusive, then sometimes we have the tendency to do it in a, in a rather wrong way because we address the different vulnerabilities in silos and this hinders us from being efficient, from being coherent and also very often from uh, addressing the intersectionality between the different vulnerabilities. But of course, there is a commitment and great interest by the sector to address jointly some of these uh, challenges. And on the positive side, there is also an increased support with the system to national and local NGOs. And this is very important because national and local NGOs represent uh, uh, the affected people or a part of a, of a affected uh, people community. And by working with them, we are better able to, to reflect the, the situations and the voices of people affected by crisis. Therefore, in this uh, session, I have invited a number of colleagues representing national and local NGOs from different contexts to really share about their work on uh, on protection and how they follow a people-centered approach in their uh, protection work. I will ask them some questions and then we'll have us a chance to uh, to hear from you, from you and for you to interact through 
questions and answers with the speakers. We'll have also three questions that uh, you all ask the, you will be asked to, to answer through Mentimeter exercises. And at the end, I have also the, the pleasure to have uh, here in this uh, discussion a representative of a government and donor agency who will also present his point of view and his takeaways of the meeting. Um, so before uh, introducing the, the uh, speakers, I also wanted to, to thank a bit the organizations who worked with ICVA in preparing this, uh, this uh, session, and in specific CHS Alliance, Help Age, Humanity and Inclusion, HIAS, UNFPA, and of course the, the Government of the Netherlands and the colleagues of the Global Protection Cluster. Thank you very much. Thank you also all of you for attending this session. I'm looking forward to it. And thanks, of course, to, to the speakers that I will introduce right now. So I hope that the, the first uh, speaker will uh, is connected because uh, he texted just before the meeting starting saying that he's dealing with an emergency. Uh, so I hope he is joining us. I will still introduce him and maybe he comes then a bit later. He is Michael Merwara. He is the Director of Knowledge Development and Innovation and TPO Uganda. TPO Uganda is a non-governmental organization that started its work in Uganda in 1994 and has since uh, been active also in few other countries in the region. And it's an organization that works a lot on protection, especially child protection and mental health and psychosocial support. As a second guest in this session, I have uh, Ms. Larissa Baida, who is the head of programs at the National Assembly of Persons with Disability of Ukraine, NAPD. Welcome, uh, Ms. Larissa. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And for colleagues that don't know NAPD, uh, it was founded in September 2001. It has a membership of, if I'm correct, 120 public organizations representing uh, the interest of people with disabilities from all regions of Ukraine. And uh, in its membership, it includes uh, organizations that uh, represents different um, uh, different groups of people with disabilities and have conditions. We have women with disabilities organizations. We have the elderly with uh, disability organization, parents of children with disabilities, etc. Another speaker that we'll listen to is uh, Mr. Danilo Manzano. He is the co-founder and director of Dialogo Diverso, which was an, is an organization that started its activity in Ecuador, thanks to the contribution of human rights defenders. And the organization works today in various countries in the region, defending the rights of the most vulnerable people, including LGBTQI population, and looking at specifically at the migration and forced displacement context. Then we have also Dr. Aisha Tawab, who is the chairwoman of uh, ABS Development Organization for Women and Children in Yemen, also known as uh, ADO. Uh, ADO is one of the first organizations that has been operating in Yemen since 1996, and it has adopted in its work a strong need-based approach, working with the most vulnerable uh, parts of a community, and it has a strong program of protection, putting women at the, at the center. And then, as I said, we have also a representative of a government, Andre Van Mens, who is a counselor on humanitarian migration and health affairs with a permanent representation of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Geneva. So thank you very much to all the, all the speakers. And uh, as you see in this uh, session, um, 
Uh, we have some uh, colleagues that comes from countries where there is a protection cluster active and operating right now. But we have also a few other colleagues that represent different realities where there is no, not necessarily a, a cluster, a protection cluster operating. And we thought it would be good to also cross uh, cross fertilize the, the information and learning through the both contexts. So, Natalie, I don't know if you can help me. I cannot see all the participants, but is uh, Michael with us? He's not, right? Correct. He's not here quite yet, Merla. We've okay. also lost uh, Dr. Aisha for a little bit. She should be back. Okay. I, I hope they will join us soon. And uh, since Michael is not here, I suggest uh, I start the discussion with uh, Miss Larissa. Uh, Miss Larissa, uh, as we speak today, and I mentioned one of the aim of our discussion is really to look at uh, how we can be inclusive in our protection work. And when we speak about affected people, we speak about different vulnerabilities and uh, including disability. And as a representative of uh, NPAD, it would be very interesting to hear from you how you manage to uh, have this collaboration with humanitarian uh, actors in, uh, in Ukraine, in the response in the Ukraine, and what are some of the lessons learned and good practices that can help other countries? Because we know that Unfortunately, it's still very difficult to only include people with disabilities in humanitarian action. Thank you and over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure for me to share my experience because it's a long-term experience in humanitarian reaction, APD. We are working more than 10 years. We started working from 2014 when the uh, one part of the Ukraine was occupied. And we had new challenges when in 2022 the full-scale invasion started and we understood that we need to change our experience. On some uh, examples, I'll try to share how for not long period of time we changed our approaches and what uh, difficulties we had. We understood that the partnership should be uh, under the whole humanitarian principles. Even on the humanitarian principles, we have a discussion uh, if they are out of date or they are updated. It was the first challenge because we didn't have the same approach. Uh, Michael, are you with us? Michael, are you with us? Я зацікавлена і всіми зацікавлені в тому, щоб почути про роботу, яка виконується ТБО в Юганді, в Уганді. І, звичайно, на основі досвіду тих громад, в яких ви працюєте. Thank you very much, uh, Mirera. Um, I don't Дякую know if, дуже, uh, Мірера. Ви мене чуєте? Так, ми вас чуємо. Англійський канал. Англійський канал ніхто не чує. Я питаю, can you hear me in English? В англійському каналі. Молчок. Ніхто. A national non-government organization that delivers work mainly in mental health and psychosocial support, child protection and uh, uh, livelihood support to vulnerable uh, households. Uh, back to your question, uh, Mirera, at TPO Uganda, Larissa, the interventions are built uh, together with the people we serve is central Просто to our... Palace, so... We believe that... Uh, for us to be able to create a uh, community community ownership uh, participation of uh, these communities or people we serve is very crucial uh, for ensuring uh, of course sustainable impact but we also believe that uh, the people that we serve 
understand their needs more and better than uh, how we do uh, understand. So we try and incorporate uh, them at every stage of uh, the project uh, life cycle, right from the design uh, up to uh, exit or termination of uh, the project. Of course, at uh, the beginning, uh, we involve communities. Uh, for example, when we launched our recent child protection uh, project in the uh, refugee, among refugees, we began by conducting a needs assessment, which brought together community members from uh, the local leadership, as well as younger people who we were targeting for this particular project. And uh, through these discussions, they were able to identify uh, their priorities and concerns. Of course, uh, one of them was uh, the, 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 the issue of skilling uh, as a big problem for these young, uh, uh, for these young people. So while we were, so that helped us to inform us that beyond just doing the protection work, we also need to build their skills in uh, various interventions that can help them to enjoy and be meaningful citizens. So we leveraged on those insights uh, to ensure that the program addresses both the specific needs of the uh, of, of the beneficiaries or the individuals that we serve, but also uh, responding to the broader context-driven challenges uh, that the grant was meant uh, for. Similarly, we, we were able to integrate mental health and psychosocial support in one of our parenting uh, programs, where we actually realized that one of the key drivers of poor parenting for children was the distress that comes with the uh, parenting and child rearing. So for us to realize the most effective uh, outcomes of this uh, grant, we decided we, we, together with the community and the people, they were able to suggest that we include uh, counseling sessions as part of the parenting program. So we, we had to adapt and revise our parenting model to include in uh, at least a few sessions that cover uh, counseling, especially for parents. Um, we also uh, engage and integrate feedback mechanism. Uh, this helps us to uh, monitor the relevancy of the project but because yes, at the beginning, the project could be relevant, but along the way context change, new issues come up. So we, through this feedback, we are able to measure ourselves if the program is still uh, relevant to the needs of, of the people. So we do this, we establish feedback and accountability structures, such as the regular feedback sessions. Every time we are in the communities and uh, engaging with the different stakeholders and beneficiaries, we try to consult with them and uh, ensure that uh, we take care of uh, the concerns that they have. We have suggestion boxes, which we popularize in the different target uh, communities. And as well, uh, we have uh, community volunteers or, or, or people that we have established. And these ones specifically are there to help us uh, be accessible because they are those that may not have access to any of the other platforms. So with them in the community, it is very easy for them to, uh, for, for the community to be able to engage them and give them feedback about our interventions. All this is in addition, of course, to the total free line uh, that we have and we publish it on all our social media platforms. If you check our website, uh, www.tpou.com, UG.org, you will see the the total free line there, and you're able to give uh, feedback. And in fact, if there is any feedback you have for this particular presentation that I'm making uh, for TPU, you are welcome to use that uh, uh, total free line to be able to give feedback as well as uh, uh, the email. So those feedback mechanism channels help us to engage and uh, interact with our communities. Uh, but most importantly, through these, of course, there are lessons, there are new experiences. And like I mentioned, 
uh, beneficiaries usually understand their needs, but they also understand uh, some of the solutions uh, that can best address those uh, 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 problems or needs they have. And in so, we facilitate them to uh, innovate or to come up with ideas, what we call the uh, CLI, the community-led innovations, especially through the use of design thinking, where we go with the communities and engage with them, uh, ask them about the problem and what the solution uh, could be. For instance, in one of our livelihood projects, uh, which was targeting women, uh, we had a design, a community design uh, workshop, uh, which helped us to generate solutions on the unique challenges which uh, the women were, were were facing, and this was mainly linked to the community uh, serving groups, uh, where of uh, uh, women were saying that uh, while it is good for them to save and they save. But uh, whenever they save and they accumulate some money during the time of sharing out, the husbands, uh, their husbands would come and take the money. So uh, they, they, we, we asked them, how can you as women innovatively uh, come up with a solution that can uh, help uh, address that? And women themselves, they, they started uh, 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 what they called the rich men uh, for saving uh, intervention where they would uh, reach out to identify these men uh, who had this vice or this problem and they would they, they themselves go uh, uh, invite this visit this uh, household uh, of their member who has a problematic husband and try to dialogue with them and it has paid off because uh, uh, many of the men have started appreciating uh, the value of uh, women in saving. So these are just examples of uh, you know how we continuously engage. And uh, for this uh, rich men for saving intervention or innovation that the the the, the women started, they they it, we did not incur any cost. It is themselves they identify the household. They mobilize themselves, visit the household, talk to, to 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 the member, and things work out, and it has helped achieve greater impact for our project. So our work with the Chess Alliance has amplified these efforts and given us access to best practices uh, in the community. Previously, these are things we never used to take much interest in. But after jo joining the CHS Alliance and uh, uh, going through all the uh, audit and uh, certification processes, we started realizing the value they, they contribute. And uh, we have globally and, uh, of course, locally been recognized as uh, one of the championing organizations for uh, the core humanitarian standards. And through these partnerships and frameworks, we make sure that our interventions reflect co uh, the co uh, humanitarian standards on quality and accountability. And we prioritize uh, participation, learning, and adaptation throughout our experiences. Participation, learning, and adaptation. We want everyone to participate. We want to learn, but we also want to adapt to be able to uh, deliver you. quality interventions. So. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Mireille. Thank you, Michael. And you gave us a very comprehensive overview of the work you do and uh, some of the challenges and how you sought also to to address these challenges. And uh, speaking about challenges, I would be interested to read from all the participants about what they see as, uh, as the main challenges in ensuring uh, 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 protection work that is based on the voices of people affected by crisis. So please, colleague, if you could put the Mente exercise uh, um, 
for if you can make it available for the participants and the participants, if you can start ask, answering the, the questions on the three main challenges that you see in your work. And if you can use just one word per, per challenge so that we can see a bit what comes out of the of a, of a exercise. Just to mention that the code, the link to the Menti is in the chat. You can reach yes. it there or you can go to menti.com and use the code on your screen. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So I hope that we'll no, start no, no, no. To, to see some of the answers that are coming from the Menti, and I see already a few words, interpretation, yes, a challenge, security, engaging, participation, acceptance, funding uncertainties, conversations, high expectations, patience, someone put it on the chat box, gatekeeping, government retaliation as well is being mentioned social norms time security security so yes lots of good feedback and we see again that uh, it is challenging but uh, i think these are also discussions that help us to see how we can uh, how we can uh, address some of these uh, challenges. Okay, colleagues, uh, we'll continue to do the, the exercise, but uh, maybe I will uh, also move uh, again back to, to Larissa. And I know that uh, interpretation is no longer available, unfortunately. And colleagues, uh, translators are acting into a challenging context in Ukraine, but we have a colleague uh, following the, the session and she is Ukrainian and uh, she she speaks uh, both English and Ukrainian. So I will very much ask Yulia to, to help us because I want to make sure that uh, we all listen from, uh, from Larissa. So Larissa, I would ask you again the same question. If you can just be very brief, please, and explain a bit how will you build this partnership with humanitarian actors and the main lessons learned. And then uh, Julia will make like a summary of, uh, of your points in English for, for us. Thank you very much, both to you, Larissa, and for Julia, to Julia for stepping in. Over to you, Larissa. Uh, thank you. Юля, будемо працювати. Так. Я повторюся і скажу, що наш досвід. Ми зрозуміли, що партнерство – це дотримання гуманітарних принципів прав людини. Це спільне бачення і розуміння питань інвалідності. Ми говоримо однією мовою в питаннях інвалідності. Це були два перші виклики і ризики, з якими ми зіткнулися. So um, the, in, in regard to the partnership, uh, the key uh, challenges were uh, related to the humanitarian principles. Uh, of Larissa? Yes, yes. Можете повторити, будь ласка, останнє Це дотримання гуманітарних принципів прав людини. І друге, це спільне бачення, розуміння питань інвалідності і спільне бачення. Uh, so the key challenges were in regards of um, following the humanitarian principles and uh, having the common vision and um, the rights of uh, obeying the rights of people with disabilities. Перший рік війни в Україну йшло дуже багато гуманітарної допомоги. In the first year of war there was a lot of humanitarian aid coming to Ukraine. Але через нерозуміння питань інвалідності багато нашої цільової групи залишились поза увагою. But without clear understanding of the issues of disability, a lot of uh, people uh, were left behind. 
Відсутність альтернативних форм комунікації та інформації. Який іще у вас lack of the alternative form, alternative form of information? Of delivering the information and недоступність місць, недоступність фізична місць роздачі гуманітарної допомоги, стереотипи щодо людей з інвалідністю. Uh, and also uh, unaccessibility uh, or and barriers to the uh, places of um, humanitarian aid uh, delivery and uh, also um, Uh, the stereotypes and stigmatization around people with disabilities. Це тільки деякі виклики, з якими ми зіткнулися. It's just few challenges. Але за цей час ми зробили багато. But we did a lot during that time. Ми налагодили партнерство і змінили ситуацію. We built the partnerships and changed the situation. Ми почали інтенсивно працювати з кластерами, з агенціями ООН і всіма міжнародними гравцями. We started actively cooperate with clusters, UN agency and other uh, international actors. Партнерство це щоденна робота. Partnership is everyday work. Ми почали говорити про інвалідність, про людей похилого віку. We start to talk about disability and uh, elderly people. Я наведу деякі приклади, щоб ви зрозуміли. Перші продуктові набори в Україні, які видавалися гуманітарними гравцями, це було 7,5 кг рису, 7,5 кг спагетті і пляшка олії. Uh, so one example the food kits uh, that have Seven kilos of rice, um, seven kilos of potatoes, spaghetti, and uh, a bottle of oil. Але ми всі різні, і потреби в нас всіх різні. І ми почали говорити, що ми не можемо багато з нас не вживають цих продуктів. But we all are different, and we can say that some people don't use those products. І це приклад може бути швидким реагуванням продовольчої програми ООН, яка надавала ці продукти. And this can be an example of World Food Program UN that provided those foods. Ми сіли за стіл переговорів, ми зустрічалися, ми багато говорили, і зараз ми подолали цей бар'єр. We met together, worked a lot on that, and now we overcame this barrier together. Точно так же з кластером ВОЖ, коли мова йде про засоби гігієни. It's relevant also to work with wash cluster when we talk about the hygiene kits. Є стандарти, але ми розуміємо, що ми всі різні. There are standards, but we understand we all are different. Серед нас є стомовані хворі, люди з цукровим діабетом, діти, дорослі, і у нас потреби в засобах гігієни дуже різні. Uh, among us are people with different uh, health issues, for example, diabetes and other. So they have other needs. І ми хочемо змінити ці стандарти. Нічого немає сталого. Ми з вами маємо це зрозуміти. Війна в Україні показала, що потреби людей з інвалідністю, людей похилого віку мають бути враховані на всіх етапах гуманітарної допомоги. And the war in Ukraine uh, proved and shown that um, the um, interests of people with disability and elderly uh, must be and can be included on all the levels of implementation of uh, projects and programs. And Наприклад, завдяки підтримці в Україні кластерів захисту і групи з питань інвалідності людей похилого віку, нам вдалося проадвокатувати введення соціальної реабілітації в гуманітарну діяльність. A good example is uh, the cooperation with protection cluster and um, uh, Asian Disability Technical Working Group. And we are a little out of time, so I pass it uh, to Mirella. Що ми дуже добре зробили? Ми Пані Лариса, вибачте, ми по часу вже трошки не можемо. Ще хвилину. Що ми ще зробили? Ми в гуманітарному плані проадвокатували питання інвалідності і зробили їх наскрізними. 
we advocated for the question of disability in the humanitarian needs response plan and made it cross-cutting. Ми зрозуміли, що участь людей на всіх етапах гуманітарної реагування є важливою. Ми зрозуміли, що локалізація в партнерстві є дуже важливою. We understand that localization is an important point and participation is also a key point. І сьогодні наша позиція людина похилого віку, людина з інвалідністю і всі вразливі групи мають бути в центрі уваги гуманітарного реагування. In our position that elderly people and people with disabilities must be in the center of humanitarian response. Дуже дякую. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh... I understand that uh, you have lots of enthusiasm to speak about this subject because you have also lots of good experiences and positive results to, to share with us. So thank you very much. And thank you, Yulia, for, for covering the, the translation. It would have been really regretful not to, to listen from this uh, rich experience in coming from, uh, from colleagues in Ukraine. And I, I listened to both uh, Michael and uh, Larissa, and they were very complimentary to, to each other. Michael explained the, the work with the community and how that helps build the, the intervention. And then Larissa said uh, so how they they built uh, from that community at the organizational level, but then they also work in the in the partnership uh, in partnership and with other actors. And it was very relevant to hear from you about the importance of localization, uh, Larissa. And we have another speaker today with us, Dr. Aisha in, uh, in Yemen, who also comes from a, from a local organization. And it's a local organization that is led by women that works with uh, women on protection. And Dr. Aisha, everyone I hear speaking today about commitment and support to women-led organization and everyone recognizes the, the importance uh, of engaging women in uh, peace building, in humanitarian intervention and development. But uh, in your work concretely at the country level, how do you feel? Do you feel supported enough and what would you like to, to see improved? Uh, Hello, Dr. Aisha Thawab, Director of APS Organization for Development of Women and Children in Yemen. In fact, we were, we've been working with women since 1996. And uh, when I was at my first university year, and I was the first woman from the governorate of Abbas who was doing university studies, and I was very enthusiastic to work to protect women and to advocate for women's rights to education. And as you know, that Yemen is going into a war and crisis. And in fact, this has taken back, taken us back to the Middle Ages, where women or girls do not have the right to go out of their houses to uh, a faraway place that is uh, three or four kilometers without a man to protect her, which is called a muhram. Do you mean what is that? If a woman wanted to go out of her house, she needs to be accompanied by a man to uh, protect her according to the new law which was uh, lately voted. In fact, we as women organizations, we uh, suffer from violations, deprivation and abuse. In fact, the uh, protection programs in Yemen are being considered with apprehension and looked at as a danger. And we as women's organizations, we do our best and we even put ourselves in danger in order to protect women. 
uh, to build the women to to help and to protect our uh, uh, but we have challenges we have security challenges uh, scarcity of funds uh, and uh, security issues are missed uh, at all and the interventions by uh, some international organizations though there are uh, speeches that we should focus on women and take care of women but many organizations are simply taking those as the mottos but when we want to implement actually we find nobody to support us women-led organizations in Yemen are suffering a lot it seems as if we are we were a ball that everybody is kicking uh, to another direction of course we are uh, we are trying our best to work and to continue working under the humanitarian law and the humanitarian principle but we want all the organizations provide security, uh, protection, and funds to empower women, to empower women on the economic level so women can protect themselves from violence. And we hope that the donors and the international organizations to adopt the uh, pr principle and the mechanism of the three directions to to, pro to provide sustainable protection and uh, to support cases of protection and safety uh, so that would help Yemeni women in this uh, hard time. So we hope to see real participation of women through the principles of localization and access approach. This would give a little uh, women leaders uh, the freedom to uh, to be involved in a protection programs effective re, uh, really effective programs so women won't uh, go back to dark times because women can be leaders whether they are even young men or uh, different uh, ages we target different type of women and we enhance the resources of security and peace for women and different type of people we hope that the international organization would listen to local organizations uh, women led uh, local organizations there are many women led organizations and there are many yemeni women uh, uh, they might be illiterate but by time and the practice they learned a lot so those women might be might have uh, might be wise more than us uh, the, uh, so they might have solutions to problems of violence and economic problems so we hope that those women would be empowered by the donors and the international organizations we hope that they would understand the situation of women in Yemen in Yemen so we are trying because though we have no safety and security but we look for support and advocacy of women cases whether in the north or the south because you might notice here that there is a difference in and peace and security in the south and the north. And thank you very thank much you so for much, listening. Um, what you highlighted, I'm sure, resonates with other participants here that represents local and national NGOs, and especially the ones that work with uh, with women. And I'm already seeing that the uh, Colleagues are also reacting in the in the chat box about what they see in terms of challenges uh, in uh, ensuring a people-centered uh, approach in protection work. Um, I would uh, before going to to the next speaker, I would uh, suggest uh, another mentee exercise. If colleagues uh, supporting us with the technology can put the, the question here, and of course the, the link to the Mentimeter is in the chat box. But uh, this time I would be interested to, to read from you about uh, uh, what do you recommend as efficient in supporting national and local NGOs work in, uh, in protection? So this is the... the the, the question and uh, if we can see maybe what comes up from this uh, uh, 
uh, this menti. Um, so it's about uh, recommend uh, what works efficiently in supporting national and local NGOs who work in protection. And I already see some reaction, give ownership, direct funding, mentoring, capacity building, co-leadership, trust, advocacy, learning event, partnerships, uh, sensitization, shifted mindset, um, so thank you, colleagues. These are all very valid points, and I'm sure that uh, after this meeting, we'll make sure that uh, this your contribution is not lost, but that they also have the, the work of a protection cluster and within the system to to shift the power and to make sure that our intervention is uh, more people-centered. Uh, another speaker that uh, I have today with uh, with us, we have today with us, is uh, Danilo, and I already uh, introduced you, uh, Danilo. But uh, it's very interesting to to know more about the, the work your uh, your organization you do is doing because uh, uh, when we speak about LGBTQ LGBT QI persons and uh, we also recognize that uh, sometimes they are left aside and the protection needs are not duly responded to and they do not receive uh, the protection support that uh, that they need. And this can be quite challenges in some contexts also with national legislation criminalizing uh, same-sex acts. So it would be very relevant to hear more about the work that you do, how you engage concretely with uh, LGBTQI plus persons and what kind of assistance and support you provide them with. Thank you, Danila. Thank you so much, uh, Mirella, and hello to everyone uh, present at this, uh, at this space. It is a pleasure to me and have the opportunity uh, to talk to all of uh, to all of you. Well, our program uh, begins in Ecuador. At the end of uh, 2018, we create Diálogo Diverso as an LGBTQ organization focused on the LGBT plus community. As you may know, the Venezuelan situation and the different circumstances about the absence of human rights and zero public policy for LGBTQ plus community motivates that over 8 million people from Venezuela use the country and try to identify different opportunities in different places. At the beginning, like Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, among other countries in South America. At that moment, we identify that the LGBTQ plus community looking at that moment for humanitarian assistance uh, there, there were not a place who can provide this humanitarian assistance. So the international cooperation operating in Ecuador at that time and different organizations, they thought that a single uh, man, a single person at the frontier, they were not allowed to be recognized as a person in risk. So we create uh, my home away from home program, thinking to provide this support and this safe space for the LGBTQ migrants. After six years, we have the opportunity to provide over 10,000 assistance per year. And our program consists in the, uh, in the assistance for medicine, lawyer, social work, and psychological support for the LGBTQ migrant and local community. Uh, the experience uh, has been very challenging, particularly because at the beginning, there were not experience at all in Ecuador and other countries in Latin America to work with the LGBTQ migrants and asylum seekers. After six years, providing and working directly with the communities because we are a grassroots organization, opportunity to work also uh, with different uh, cooperators as high as, as the BPRM of the United States, 
with different agencies from the from the United Nations, like IOM and UNCR, among others, give us the chance to make this program sustainable in the time. I want to uh, finish this first part of integration respecting the time that I have to tell you that one of the biggest um, opportunities and the biggest goals about our program has been to create technical capacities, not only for the universe, about LGBTQ migration. It is also to share this knowledge with other LGBTQ organizations who wants to work on migration and also for the humanitarian assistance. So the last six months, working together with Hayas, we create two wonderful documents. The first one is to provide this dignity guidance, dignity attendance for the LGBTQ migrants and asylum seekers. And this is a very important tool because some of them, when they try to get in information support to the first line people from the governments or for different cooperators, they don't have an idea how to work with LGBT migration. So this technical knowledge is essential for the people who support migrants in the first uh, in different terms or in the first part of the, of the programs. And the second one is that the LGBTQ organizations the human rights defenders of LGBTQ rights have been talking for the last uh, for the last years. We have been talking a lot about how important it is to be in safe spaces, and at the end, it was, it was also important to identify what is a safe space and how can we create a safe space. So, the last six months with Hayas, we were working so hard. And finally, we have this document, this methodology is a guidance. So right now, create and save space as a program by their own. So we would love to share all this experience with all the people in here interested about why it is important to work for the LGBTQ migrations, but the most important is to work between, working with peers. Our program makes a difference because all the team of our professionals are part of the LGBTQ community as well. What makes things more easy at the moment to have the contact, the conversation, and also to identify and understand the different necessities. That's what I can tell uh, to answer this first question. Thank you very much, uh, Danilo. And again, you highlighted some very important elements like the need to, to have a safe space. And if we look at some of the challenges that participants mentioned in ensuring a people-centered approach, visitors uh, was captured by this uh, by these challenges and there are different uh, blockages and hindrances in there in creating that uh, safe space. Uh, colleagues, I, I see there are many reactions and there are some questions already ch shared in the in the chat box. I wanted to continue the the discussion with uh, our panelists, but uh, I see that we are running out of time. So I would have one more question for for the panelists, and maybe Michael, you'd like to to answer this one as also representative of the CHS uh, Alliance, but uh, um, silo because uh, when we speak about diversity goal of uh, diversity of individuals and uh, diversity of needs and so on, as I said at the beginning, we have a bit of a tendency as a sector to approach this in, in silos. Uh, in your work, how do you try to, to avoid this, uh, this silos, uh, Michael? Thank you again, uh... <clears throat> Mirera, uh, for this uh, question. And um, at TPO Uganda, we avoid, of course, silos uh, or divisions in our work by, uh, again, uh, embedding partnerships, uh, collaboration, integration, linkages, and transparency throughout uh, our work. And uh, we, we actually have a slogan, uh, which is the uh, PCL, uh, PCL meaning P for partnership, C for collaboration, I for integration, and L for linkages uh, as a way of us ensuring that uh, 
we work with the rest of the other partners that are doing similar or uh, related work. And our approach is based on the belief that uh, sustainable in, uh, sustainable impact requires the efforts of everyone as an institution. We cannot achieve everything or address all the needs of the people that uh, we serve uh, or, or that are related to child protection and uh, mental health. So we actively foster these partnerships and collaborations, uh, specializing in complementary areas uh, as well as uh, other uh, areas that are very critical for the needs of the people. So for example, education, healthcare, and economic empowerment. Because if we, we are implementing a child protection intervention, then we must see that even these other cross-cutting components are well taken care of. Uh, but also there is a, uh, there is more collaboration than uh, competition. One of the characteristics, so the symptoms of silos is a competition. People want to compete against uh, uh, each other. So we, we ensure that we collectively uh, work together as uh, organizations. We've created uh, what we call uh, working groups for each of these different areas. We have the National Child Protection Working Group. We have uh, the National Mental Health Working Group, which brings partners that are working in this same space together to be able to discuss uh, in Uganda, we have what we call the five W the five W uh, framework uh, that we complete. The five W framework basically describes it: uh, who you target, uh, uh, when you deliver it, why you're delivering it, and the the the, the how. So that once we complete, you once you feed in that framework, it is shared across all partners. So they know that this partner is working here and this is what they are doing. And so the other partner can come in only to support and complement uh, that work. This, of course, has helped us to avoid uh, uh, competition, but also working in isolation, which aligns with the, our goal of uh, creating seamless uh, systems to support and enhance uh, our combined uh, impact. Uh, we also ensure integration and linkages. We develop programs that reinforce each other across sectors. For example, our mental health support uh, for children is linked with education initiatives. We have a program called Education Can't Wait, but there we have our mental health program. Uh, we have uh, that, and of course, that is ensuring that children receive holistic care that addresses their needs. Uh, we have regular joint uh, planning and implementation or review uh, meetings with the different stakeholders. Uh, again, this is to discuss links and the uh, adapt activities that fit the community needs uh, while making uh, uh, effective referrals uh, or linkages. And uh, I'm using the word effective because it is very critical. Many times we link people uh, to various opportunities and they are, they don't receive the support or services. That does not make it effective. Effective is when these uh, linkages end up into service delivery and the satisfactory service delivery. So we have uh, those uh, integration and linkages forums and uh, uh, joint uh, activities where we follow up <coughs> and uh, support one another to be able to deliver those uh, comprehensive and complementary services to the team. Thank and you. of course, lastly, the issue of transparency is very key uh, to avoid silos. You, you should be able to put up your work there for people to know what you're doing and how you're doing it such that, that it avoids duplication. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And we could continue this discussion on each of the subject. We could have a discussion on its own and colleagues from uh, other contexts. I'm sure you would have a lot to, to add to this conversation as well. I uh, just invite uh, all participants to do the last Menti exercise for the session. And the question to, to answer is how do you avoid silos in your uh, in your work and then more specifically 
It's about like what is required for a more coherent approach to inclusiveness and accountability in protection work. So what is uh, required for a more coherent approach to inclusiveness and accountability in protection? And we have already some uh, some answers here from colleagues speaking about strength and coordination, safe programming, participatory uh, trust, implementing partner, partner, updating of protocols, inclusive programming, uh, strength, respect, uh, uh, in people norms, I guess it's respecting people's norms, um, intersectionality, coordination comes again, so Lots of good elements that again will help to to push us to reflect further on how to to improve our work. So we are coming to to the end of the session. So I open now the Q and A discussion. If you have questions, please use the Q and A uh, and the chat box to to ask those questions, and I will share them with uh, our panelists. And I see that there was already uh, some exchanges between participants and our speakers. I saw Danilo, you shared your uh, contacts. Thank you very much for that. And colleagues, please feel free to to reach out to uh, Danilo and the uh, con uh, contact details of Larissa are also shared with you in the, in the chat box. So if you would like to, to know more after this meeting, feel free also to, to reach out to, to the colleagues. But uh, the, the chat is open for, uh, for any question that you might want to, to ask to, to the speakers. So I see here in the Q&A uh, uh, chat box, so there is a, there is a question to, to Michael, how do you ensure equitable access to the feedback mechanisms used to collect feedback from the community beneficiaries? So it's about access to the feedback mechanisms. If you could briefly answer this, Michael. Good. Um... Th th thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, one, uh, the power of uh, effective feedback lies in awareness uh, or sensitization of uh, uh, the community, but also the people that are handling uh, the feedback. So we, one, our, one of our key elements is to empower, build the capacity of the people that uh, in this feedback loop mechanism at all levels. And this is mainly uh, our staff, our colleagues who are actually uh, continuously receiving this feedback. And as you know, feedback comes in at different levels at Michael? We don't hear you anymore, I think. There is a a problem with a connection. Maybe we come back to to you, Michael. Uh, we have uh, another question. Yeah. I... Yeah. Michael, we don't hear yeah. your That's... colleagues. So all our uh... staff were or feedback to X. Hello. Yes, we lost you for a little bit. So. Do you hear me? Now we hear you. Yes. Uh, you can, you can hear me now. Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so I was saying that uh, the power of uh, feedback or equitable feedback lies in awareness. So we empower and build the capacity of people that are handling or dealing with this feedback, but then also sensitize the masses, the communities that we are working with uh, about the various uh, feedback channels, uh, mechanisms, and try to encourage them as much as possible to uh, share any form of information or feedback that they have and uh, we encourage them to 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 leave it open regardless whatever nature of feedback they they are able to give it to us but uh one of the of course the issues we've learned is that sometimes there are people who may not be 
uh, able to access the feedback channels or freely be able to express themselves. So what we do when we have these community uh, activities, we try to reach out. As, uh, for example, the people with disabilities, when we are doing community activities and we know where these people are and they've benefited or from our services or they're in the target location, we target them and look out to them and do a kind of a survey, ask them how they feel about our programs, what we need to do to uh, make them better and, and, and things like that. So, we, we, so it is a two-way thing. You sensitize and um, uh, popularize your feedback mechanism, but also you, you, you may want to reach out to uh, these people who may have challenges to give, provide Thank feedback. Thank you, Michael. Because we lack time, I have a, another question for Aisha. Aisha, you speak English perfectly. So if you could answer this in English and avoid the, the translation uh, technical issues that we might have. The, the question is about the work on early marriage and child marriage, in uh, forced marriage and child marriage, if you have work in these areas and if you could share briefly what you do with colleagues. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, I will speak in Arabic. Uh, early marriage, actually, uh, there is a high percentage of early message, uh, early marriage, and through the war and the conflict, many fathers and mothers, actually, they sold their children, their girls, displaced people were able to take their little uh, girl, who is uh, only 12 years old or even 10 years old, and took her to, uh, uh, to uh, another man so he can uh, get her girl married, so he can get uh, in, uh, food or a shelter for her, for her family. It was a big problem, and we suffered from this a lot since the beginning of war till now. Early marriage is widely spread, though actually we, we managed to stop early marriage before war, and uh, we have what we call it... Uh, 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 we have another problems, uh, social problems uh, that we managed to stop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. One question, I think that you uh, might answer this one. It's about the contribution that uh, you have from the state. How do you collaborate with, uh, with the states or with the different agencies? Thank you. Uh, my dear Mirella, when you said about the state, you mean our country in, in Ecuador? Are we? Feel free. I think the, the question, I don't even know if it is addressed and specific to you. I think it's for all the speakers. So feel free to answer looking at one context in particular or as if you work in different uh, countries without the region, another oh, one, okay. uh, yeah, up to you, really. And if you see differences from one country to the other, could be also interesting. For sure. Thank you so much. Well, at this point, it is very important to mention that after the first uh, four years to work about the LGBTQ migration and, and human mobility in general, we have uh, a new necessity. And it was because uh, there's the people in South America trying to move to the north. As you may know, all the danger that uh, is the experience, particularly in the Darien, this is the border between Colombia and Panama, particularly, among others. When you're LGBTQ and when you decide to move, the circumstances are different, the risks are different, and the opportunities sometimes, unfortunately, are less. You know, the the what it means being LGBTQ plus in Latin America represent less opportunities and more risk and more violence. With that understanding, we identified that it was so important to start working together with the other countries. So that's why working with Rainbow Railroad and with the support of the international uh, development research from Canada, the IDRC, we started working on a research in eight countries in Latin America, trying to understand what are the real opportunities that the LGBTQ migrants have based on the public politics. The constitutions for our countries are different. 
none of the LGBTQ rights has legal rights in a lot of our countries. What it represents at the end is that even in Ecuador, the population get with marriage, that circumstances is not happening in Peru, like example, you know? So it is so important to study uh, what's going on in every country and if the country has or not opportunities or equal rights for LGBTQ migrants. Suddenly, suddenly in South America, like example, when Venezuela is the worst country to live, if you are LGBT, Venezuela is the worst country. Then Peru has no opportunities for the LGBTQ population. Bolivia is the same and Paraguay. You know, all the other countries were starting understanding better and creating opportunities for the people. So right now, because I want to be fast at this point, we create a regional network for the LGBTQ migration. We are very happy and, and very proud in the best way to, to mention that this effort came true uh, this year. With the, the creation of this network, we put together 13 countries and 14 LGBTQ plus organizations from civil society. This network is specifically created for work about LGBTQ migration. So the different organizations uh, representing different countries they are part of this network because they have programs focus on the LGBTQ migration. So right now we're sharing knowledge. We're also learning together. We have to put our skills in the same level about the human mobility among other circumstances for human rights, you know? So uh, this, uh, the results of this research are going to be available in a month. So to all the people who wants to know about the, the results of this, uh, of this research, for sure, we can share all uh, that information. At the end, at the end, what I think it is important to say is that when you are a grassroots organization like us, in Dialogo Diverso, we are a grassroots organization. When we, when we put in paper a project, it's, it's not because our fantasy, it's not because our desire, it's not because what we think is going to be better for the people. It's not like that. We work with the people as a grassroots as a grassroots organization. We know where we are. We know where we are located, and this is a message, particularly for the international cooperation or agencies of the United Nations. Work directly and with the grassroots organizations is the best key to understand better what's happening on the territories. This work that we have done with Hayas has provided us a lot of knowledge. The localization objective provides us more information, more skills. So work directly with the people is less a challenge and more an opportunity to understand each other in better circumstances and with less risks. risk. Sorry. Thank you very much, Danilo. Colleagues, I see there are also other questions in the in the chat box, but uh, due to lack of time, uh, I'm afraid to not be able to to go one by one to all of them. And this is also a lesson learned that uh, listening to everyone needs time. So this is also important. Then uh, in our work, we we get the time needed to to really ensure a people-centered approach to our protection work. Danilo, you, you ask a message to government representative. You made a call actually to, to them to work with a grassroots organization that represent more directly the people. I see here in the chat box there are also some questions that are addressed to, to governments. And uh, as I said from the beginning, we have the pleasure to have Andre with us today, who represents the permanent missions of uh, Kingdom of Netherlands here in, uh, in Geneva. Andre, what is your takeaway from this uh, discussion we we have uh, the call that uh, Danilo made to to the government and then if I see us of uh, the chat box it's a specific question about the how Netherlands is supporting people centered approach within its humanitarian uh, strategies over to you Andre Thank you, Mirella. Thank you to all the other panelists for uh, their very insightful presenta uh, presentations. Uh, it's very good to see so many people here. I'm very glad to be here uh, 
in this session of the of, of the global protection um, uh, forum. Um, yeah, those are good questions. I mean, I had prepared some 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 points that I wanted to make, but I'll try to react a little bit to the questions that were posed and to what has been said. Um, let me start by saying that a lot of what I've heard uh, really resonates with what we hope that we can uh, uh, contribute as a donor. You know, if we sp speak about intersectionality, if we speak about uh, uh, accountability, the feedback, the, the speaking to people, the centrality of 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 citizens in 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 uh, in what we do as humanitarians, uh, uh, and of obviously the centrality of protection. So I, I didn't hear. I mean. I heard a lot of things that we also aspire to. Now, as a donor, we are a little farther away from from all all this than than you are in your daily work. Um, uh, so we support several uh, uh, large humanitarian organizations, and in our conversations with them, these are the issues that we also put on the table and say we need to do this inclusively. Um, Next to that, and I'll say something about that maybe at the end, we also have certain partnerships specifically on the protection of, of civilians and, and where we try to, through long-term partnerships, to also include uh, uh, citizens uh, more closely. But maybe maybe just to, to reflect on a couple of things that were said. I mean, one thing I would like to say is interesting how, you know, we had uh, uh, the, the example. You, you spoke yourself, Mirel, about intersectionality. Uh, we heard Dr. Aisha speaking about uh, uh, the inclusion of women and the rights of women. We had heard Danilo speaking about uh, LGBTQI. Um, we heard uh, um, uh, Larissa speak about, you know, people with disabilities. I think, you know, we haven't mentioned this yet, but, you know, this is about the rights of people and the human rights of people. So I think, you know, protection starts with uh, the fact that these are international norms, international standards, international law in terms of human rights law, in terms of international humanitarian law. Um, uh, so I think it's important to to uh, um, emphasize that. I mentioned international humanitarian law. There, too, it's important to emphasize. You know, as donors, um, let me put it very bluntly, we're a very small amount of donors in the end that are, are helping out when it comes to humanitarian assistance. At the same time, we see humanitarian needs grow. Why? Because civilians are not being uh, uh, protected enough. Uh, so that that goes to how important it is to put uh, civilian center, center and front and center when it comes to dealing with, uh, with humanitarian assistance and humanitarian aid and, and our humanitarian action. The more we protect citizens, the more we empower them, uh, the, the, the lower the humanitarian needs. And, and uh, so we all have a responsibility in that respect. Uh, another thing I picked up on, uh, which I found interesting, uh, I think was Michael that said that, uh, you know, the inclusion of the local actors and the feedback of the local actors um, uh, and the inclusion. I think, Michael, you're the one who mentioned citizenship. Uh, these are citizens and they know where the solutions are. And that's why we need to put them front and center in, in the action that we, we envisage uh, and empower them um, uh, in that respect. Uh, I heard localization that goes to the same, you know, it's about capacity building. I think that also came out of the Mentimeter. It's about capacity building on the local level, uh, making sure that people are part of their own solution, uh, including the women, of, obviously. Um, so maybe just to say a couple of things about what we then as the Netherlands do, we, we have a couple of large uh, multi-year uh, partnerships with a couple of INGOs uh, that work with local organizations, with local civilian organizations in frontline settings. Uh, these are eight-year partnerships, so long-term, uh, really aimed at, you know, uh, putting the, the civilians uh, uh, at the center uh, of, of, of the action, but also, and very importantly, I think, uh, learning. I think so, several of you said that, you know, we need to also learn and study and see what works, what doesn't work, and also use that to then improve programming more, uh, but also use it to do advocacy more internationally. So that's something we, these partnerships have just started. Uh, but that's something we would be aspiring to in the in the years to come is to learn from the experiences to see what works how we can empower people and then how we can advocate for that uh, on a global level 
Um, I would be amiss if I wouldn't uh, congratulate Michael with the focus on mental health and psychosocial support. Uh, this is not only about uh, the physical well-being of people, uh, but also about their mental well-being. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'll leave it at that, uh, also considering the time, uh, Mirella. But uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be part of this conversation uh, and uh, to hear this very interesting feedback from uh, all over the world. Thank you, Andre, and we count on you as a champion to, to share the message that came out of this meeting also with other representatives of, of government and donor agencies, because it is very important to be together in these efforts to improve protection work, to ensure a more people-centered approach in our protection, and as you mentioned, to ensure respect for uh, international law, both international humanitarian law and human rights law as a, as a anticipatory action, I would say, to, to avoid crisis from, uh, from occurring and conflicts from occurring. So with this word, I would uh, close this meeting. I would like to thank once again all the colleagues that participated, but uh, first and foremost, our speakers, and there are so many thanks to the technical team and the colleagues of the Global Protection uh, Cluster for the support. So thank you very much, and for sure there is another session tomorrow. So thank you and goodbye.